I'm a herpetologist by training, meaning that I study amphibians and reptiles, things like frogs, salamanders, turtles, snakes, that kind of stuff. And a lot of my work when I was a practicing researcher was out in the field. This was trudging through swamps and streams, setting up these big giant cattle tanks, these big blue mini pools or kiddie pools, basically, to create artificial ponds and trapping in natural ponds. So on one occasion, I was out with a friend setting up turtle traps. And these are big hoop nets that basically look like finger traps, except much bigger. So the idea is that a turtle will swim into it to get the food we have in there, but it's really hard for them to get back out. It's humane, but it's just the the nature of the traps. I'm literally chest deep in this pond when I hear, Shane, don't move. There's a cotton mouth literally a foot behind you. This is a very venomous snake that just happened to be in the water, just kind of swimming around right beside me. I probably stood there for a few minutes, just just frozen, not making any sort of a move, until finally it just kind of got bored with me and turned around and swam away, at which time I beelined it out of there. I am a herpetologist, yes, but venomous snakes were never really my thing. Personally, I'll stick to frogs and turtles. Or maybe I should have gotten into fish. Everyone has a story, even, or maybe especially, scientists. Science affects each and every one of us. Let's talk about it. From the American Geophysical Union, I'm Shane Hanlon, and this is Sci and Tell. I'm really excited for today. As an ecologist by training, I don't get many opportunities to inject my research background into my work at AGU. But today, I do. So I want to bring in my co-producer, Nisha, to introduce this episode. Hey, Nisha. Hey, Shane. All right. Can you give us a little preview of what we're going to be hearing today? Yeah. So for this episode, we talked to Prasanta Chakrabarty, an ichthyologist at Louisiana State University. He talked to us about everything from discovering new fish to partying in the middle of the Amazon River, among other things. All right. Our interviewer was Paul Molin. I'm Prosanta Chakrabarty. I'm a professor and curator of fishes at Louisiana State University. But this year I'm on sabbatical doing a Fulbright in Ottawa, Canada. The proposal I wrote was to do... um, instead of like deep time evolution stuff that I usually do to do more sort of like what's going on right now in the world, in the world of fishes anyway. And so collecting things in the Ottawa River and elsewhere just to figure out if building dams and having introduced species come in changes the populations so that we could study them long term, but more uh, evolution and action stuff, but very much in line with my ichthyology background that I have. So. So when you are back home in Baton Rouge, what uh, what do your roles l- there look like? I do a 50% research, 50% teaching, and 50% curation. <laughs> so that means uh, I teach uh, one semester a year, uh, usually in the fall. So either teaching ichthyology, the study of fishes, or evolution, and sort of alternate between those two among some smaller classes if I, if I have time. And then... Uh, always doing research, trying to figure out, you know, the tree of life and how fishes evolve and and what that can tell us about evolutionary history or geological history. And, you know, planning trips, we like to do two, three international trips a year to collect fishes, to study them abroad, usually in the neotropics or or Asia somewhere. But day to day, you know, it's a lot of like, like almost everybody else sitting in front of the computer, checking email, seeing what the fires I can put out. But yeah, day-to-day is, you know, checking that uh, to-do list and see what's up. Yeah, I grew up in New York City, and there wasn't a lot of wildlife, per se, to look at. But I loved going to zoos and museums and watching, like, Marty Stauffer, you know, Wild Kingdom kind of shows. And uh, I don't know, they always, animals always got uh, got me interested in, in the world. And I mean, I remember distinctly being five or six and looking up at the dinosaurs at the American Museum and asking my my dad, you know, like, what is a person who studies, you know, animals called? And 
he said zoologist. I'm like, all right, that's what I'm going to be. You know, <laughs> there wasn't much more to it. And I'm sure like every kid has like, I want to be a fireman, policeman or whatever, astronaut. And I just picked something I, I was able to, you know, really find a passion for. And, and so for me, it was, uh, it was zoology. Yeah, I was lucky. I, I just uh, found the right people to help me along that path. I remember the big thing was working as a kid at like the Brooklyn Aquarium and uh, like I was a volunteer and I was like, I didn't really meet even then, you know, like the, the scientists behind the scenes. And I was like, I don't know what this is. And I just still like really liked animals. So I was, I was like, I'm going to go to a school that has zoology in it. And my parents had taken me to Montreal where I was actually born, but didn't live there very long because uh, when I was one, my family moved to New York. And we went to Montreal and we saw this school, McGill, and it just looked like a castle. I don't think I remember seeing a university that was sort of separated from the rest of, you know, the city, like Queens College in New York or, or NYU. You know, it's like sort of, it's just, you know, buildings sort of haphazardly strewn around. But then, you know, you, you have to go through these gates to get to McGill. And I was like, oh, it'd be cool to come here. I think it was like maybe junior high or high school, early high school. And they had a zoology program and, and, you know, I'd been saying I wanted to be a zoologist without really knowing what it meant. I was like, I should find a school that has it. So I went to McGill, got that zoology degree. A few chance encounters led me to do a, an undergrad research experience in the summer at the American Museum of Natural History, which is the, the night at the museum, famous museum with the, the dinos, plus lots of other stuff. And I worked with a wonderful person named Melanie Stiazny over that summer who taught me all about fishes and I loved her. She was just like incredibly charming and smart and knowledgeable and uh, described a new species with her. And that, and she p- kind of put me in the club to like know and all the other cool ichthyologists and sent me to a conference. After that graduating from McGill, I went on to work for a year at the Bronx Zoo in, in, uh, in the Bronx. <laughs> ironically, and uh, applied for grad schools, got into the University of Michigan, where I did a PhD for five years. That got me, you know, even deeper into the woods of of ichthyology. Did a postdoc back at the American Museum in New York. So I spent two more years doing that and got my gig at LSU 2008. So I was, I had a pretty straight path. You know, I really knew what I wanted to do early on and sort of stuck with it and had the you know, the luck of having the right people sort of hold my hand through the hard parts where I didn't understand. You know, from then it was, you know, all about helping other people get up there too. But yeah, I had a pretty, you know, quick and narrow path, you know, st- didn't have to do like a master's in something I didn't want to do or, you know, lots of undergrad projects and, and things uh, not related to what I wanted to do. So I was, I was pretty lucky. What do you think if you, as you look back on where you are now and the stuff you've done in your career, like what are the, what are the highlights, some of the highlights for you at this point? For me, it's, you know, I always think about being in the field. So just taking students out in the field, the people I've met in the field, you know, just like funny experiences with students. You know, I I remember like my postdoc advisor, John Sparks, who I went to Singapore with, like he introduced me, like on the plane is like salivating. It's like, oh, we're going to Singapore. We're going to have roti chanai. It's the most delicious like snack food. I'm like how good can it be? You know, like he describes it's like thin flaky bread and you dip it in curry. I'm like, oh, whatever. You know? And then I have it. It's like, oh my God, it's great. <laughs> and then, then when I took my student, you know, like 10 years later and I'm like on the plane, like, oh man, roti chanai is so good. Singapore is the best food. I can't wait till you try it. And he's like, oh, what's a big deal? then it's, you know, it's like a cycle, you know, things like that are, are the great, you know, you go from junior to senior really quick in academia. And, and for me, uh, just the experiences of, of giving back to the students, the same way that people gave back to me, you know, that's been really rewarding. In Tanzania, there was this like sort of shady bar, but it had like an epic drink every day, like of, you know, it's a place where you think you get, you can get like, you know, the local beer baby and hope it's cold, but they always had like this really complicated cocktail, like the cocktail of the day. 
And uh, I'd always get that no matter what it was, you know, it was always like, you know, agave uh, cider with, you know, bubble tea, something, you know, and, and then like rum, you know, and I was like, yeah, I'll have that. And at the end of my trip, you know, I took a picture with the bartender who had been making me all these drinks and, and he was on Facebook. I was like, I'll tag you on Facebook. I just wrote like best bartender in Tanzania. And then, like, underneath, like, all his friends are like, congratulations, you know, like, as if he had won an award, you know, like, <laughs> like he got, like, five stars from from the Michelin or something, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, things like that. I just love, you know, meeting local people in the Middle East. I was in Kuwait, and I don't know if you know about this, like, in each Middle Eastern country, they, they the locals have these kind of, like, high-powered jobs. And then the people cooking and, and driving the taxis and stuff are, are often imported from one particular country. So in Kuwait, there was a lot of like Bangladeshis. And I speak Bengali, which is uh, people in, in, in the east side of India speak that. And uh, so I spoke to all the locals in Bengali and I'd talk trash about like, you know, like, oh, they're bosses and stuff. And, and they'd always give me discounts on like if I was trying to buy like a fish or something for, you know, to for the collections or you know, get a, you know, it was just funny speaking ba- so much Bengali in this like Middle Eastern country, <laughs> you know, things like that. Another just funny truth. One last one. We're in the, in the middle of the Amazon and we're on a boat called Eclipsa, which is the same name that uh, Jacques Cousteau's boat was. And it, it was a party boat. That's why it was called Eclipsa. So like <laughs> the bar- boat had like basically a dance floor and like a strobe light and in the middle of the Amazon, we just play the loudest dance music all, like every other night just to, you know, because why not? And no one can hear you, you know, like you're, you're in the middle of the river. And I just love remembering flashbacks of, of things like that, you know, like these tiny moments in the field of uh, just like unexpected joy, you know, once you once you survive other things and, and, you know, get to have some fun. That's uh, That's always really important for me. I mean, I can't believe I get to do get to get paid to do the stuff I get to do, especially discovering like there's some fish I've seen. I'm just like, this is not real. Right. Like I, I know we just pulled this up. but was like, this is plastic or, you know, like I remember seeing my first, uh, I hope people look this up after, but like um, armored sea robin in Taiwan. It's just this big orange fish and has like, it's head looks like, like a fake medieval, like mask or something. And it's like bright red, I'm like, what is this? There's no way people know about this because I would have known about it. But no, you know, it's just like one of those things. When we discovered um, a new cave fish in Madagascar, like I knew holding it, I was like, there's no black cave fish. It's like, this is a new species, you know, like when you can say like, you know, you found something that's new to science and you know it right away, that's really cool. You know, often locals know about stuff that, you know, a scientists don't know about that are coming in and, and whenever I can kind of help spread the knowledge that they have to, you know, to the West or, or in a scientific way and collaborate with them, I just feel so much joy that like, oh, yeah, all right, we're, we're bringing things together, you know, like knowledge from these local places to, to you know, to the West and, and getting them involved. I love, you know, I have students from Guatemala and Cuba and, and traditionally have students from from the places I work. And it's just like a joy to be able to, to have that um, melding of, of different countries and, and their experiences. Yeah. That all that stuff's just like amazing that I get to do that. I think it's so, it, it, it I'm just like shocked that that's a, that's a job I get to do. <laughs> you know, a lot of the scientists, you know, they know that we, we just talk to each other, but we don't learn about, you know, the history of our field or, about you know things that our uh, colleagues in the humanities are working on, and and I, I just like to see like academia move forward with a more collaborative effort between groups like that. So I'm excited. I'm really excited about that. It's it's weird. It's a weird thing to do, you know, a collaborative center like that. But I'm I'm really excited about it. You know, put on some some events and get people communicating between different parts of LSU and and beyond. So you know. I've had, you know, postdocs who are or artists. I've had uh, students that had humanities interests. And I think this is a good way for us to sort of build a more interesting university by, by having those collaborations between pretty widely divergent groups. 
what do you think are the biggest challenges in science today? I think the, for me, it's, it's that science is sort of concentrated in, in uh, rich Western countries. And there's just so much knowledge and expertise that we haven't tapped into outside. I see it all the time doing field work, you know, where people often helicopter in and they, you know, as soon as they say goodbye, they never think about those people again. And for me, it's like building scientific infrastructure abroad where, you know, you can go in and really collaborate, like truly collaborate with the folks out there and understand, you know, why they live in the way they do. And I think people's perceptions of some of the countries I've been to is like, oh, that's a third world country. You know, they make a dollar a day. I'm like, you know, this person eats fish and whatever food they want every day and, you know, has, you know, spends all their time with their family and is living a great life. It's, you know, they don't have an iPod and they don't have, I don't know if anybody has an iPod anymore. I have to update my, like an iPad, <laughs> you know, like, but they, they have a, you know, they have what they need and what they don't have maybe is like access to higher ed or to maybe the kind of healthcare that we have in the West. But other than that, I mean, they're like really content and, and they know a lot of stuff about the natural world that we just don't understand. And so for me, understanding and building that scientific infrastructure is, is the biggest gap that we have, right? Like we have to understand people better to make the science work better for everybody. I'm from Florida, and I remember going on trips to the Everglades when I was younger. There are so many things to do there, but one of the best things to do is take a tour of the Everglades from the people who grew up living there. They don't have any fancy degrees, but they provide some of the most in-depth and interesting tours I've ever been on. So I agree with Rosanta. There is so much knowledge out there that isn't concentrated in a university setting, and I think science would really benefit from tapping into it. Definitely. And thanks to Prasanta for sitting down with us. And special thanks to NASA for making this episode possible, to you, Nisha, for producing, and to Paul for conducting the interview. If you like what we've heard, stay tuned for future episodes. You can subscribe to Scientel wherever you get your podcasts and find us at Scientel, all spelled out, dot org. From these scientists in our respective home studios to all of you out there in the world, thanks for listening to our stories. 